Northridge Church has been on a journey. Growing from a couple hundred to a couple thousand, it's obvious that God has been at work. Marriages have been restored, lives have been changed, and futures have been altered. But God's work here is not finished. Our mission is to make more and better followers of Jesus Christ. The people of the greater Rochester area still need Jesus, and until that need goes away, we are not done moving forward. We want to be a church that heads into the mess, and we are doing that by taking the next step. Why? Because we are for Rochester. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Northridge Church. My name's Aaron. I'm our youth pastor. Looking forward to, in the fall, transitioning to being our Henrietta Campus pastor, which is super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thanks for joining us, whether you're online or at Webster or Greece or here in Aronacoit. We are so glad that you're here, and we're continuing our series, Hashtag 4 Rock. And we're excited because our church is on the verge of something really great. We're on the verge of something that's going to be monumental. We're starting down a path that once we start, we can't come back. And it's an awesome, incredible next step. And uh, it's going to be great. But almost nothing great is easy. Almost nothing great is easy. You know, throughout history, whenever people have accomplished something great, even if it's just a, you know, a big sports victory or, you know, it's somebody who has an, comes up with an invention that takes years to perfect or like a battle or a, or a war or somebody that just rises from poverty to success in business and education, you know, in the post-game interview, it's rare that they put the microphone in the person's face and what they say is, you know, hey, how did you win the game? They're like, oh, well, it was easy. You know, that's not what they usually say, right? When they're writing the biography on somebody who did something incredible, usually the quote that they get is something like, it was really hard, but it was worth it. It was tough, but in the end, it worked out, and we're, we're excited about what, where this landed. You know, because almost nothing great is easy. And that's true for us individually, where when we come across an obstacle that's in our path that you know is going to be tough, it's hard to just take that first step. And as a church, that's really where we are. We're up against an obstacle that's a good obstacle, launching a campus. But at the same time, it's filled with the same amount of drive and fear. It can be exciting, but also terrifying. Those are two things right up against an obstacle. Anytime something comes in your path like this, a mountain in your path, it can be hard to get over it. And sometimes just taking that first step is the hard part. And it definitely is for me, okay? I, (laughs) wow, I am really, really bad at taking the first step. Like horrible, awful at taking the first step. You would not believe, I am just, that first step freaks me out so bad in any process. Like this is a silly illustration, but it works out this way when I'm like writing like a research paper. I'm still in grad school, I'll be done in May. And when I'm writing these papers, you know, it's like, I'm just, the first step of like getting words on the page is so hard. So like, I'll do all the research. I'm like reading mad books. I got like stacks of books. I'm taking notes. I'm, I got kind of an, an outline of where I want to go. So I'm taking the quotes and copying them into the outline of where they're going to go. And I'm, I'm like getting it all detailed. I got my thesis sort of worked out in my head of where it's headed. And I'll like, I'll even get all the footnotes and the end notes in Turabian format, ready to copy and paste and put into the paper, just as much prep work as I can do so I don't actually have to start or <laughs> write anything, you know. So I just will do all this prep work, and then it's like, okay, okay, the moment is here. Like, it's time. I got to write this thing. I got to do it. Let's go. Come on. So I'll like, I'll get my computer sitting there. My books are laid out. I'm a little bit like particular about how it's all sitting there. Got like a cup of coffee and a cup of water. Um, Like, it's all just like perfect. This battle station is ready to go. I'm just like, okay, let's do this. So I'll put my hands on the keyboard. I'm like, stretching. Okay, 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 okay. We got this. Let's go. Okay, 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 okay. Now, like, back up to the keyboard. And I'm, like, decent at typing. I don't really have to look at the keyboard much. And I got mocked so bad at this in college because I was just like, I got to start. I got to start. I got to. And I'll, like, I would eventually just, like, put my head down on the table. I'm like, (laughs) okay, 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 okay. (sighs) Okay, I started. I'm good. I'm taking a break. (laughs) Like, that's all I needed. I just needed to get a couple words there. Like, okay, I'm good. I'm good. All right, all right, all right, all right. I can continue tomorrow. <laughs> like, all, this is the hard part. It's just getting a couple words on that page. Just starting the process was tough for me. So I would just kind of like lay my head down and see how many words I could get before I had to look. Because it's just hard for me to stop. And now that, I mean, start. <laughs> Not hard to stop. <laughs> 
No. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's kind of a silly illustration, but that's sometimes how it is in life, and it's especially how I think it is for us as a church right now. We are up against an obstacle. We're looking to launch a campus, and we're looking to take a next step, but that first step can be hard. And so I want to look at a passage of Scripture today that I think is going to help us as we navigate whatever the obstacles are in our personal life or as a church. When we come up against something that's going to be great, but also tough, what does God's Word have to say about it? And so I would love if you would turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Um, that's on page 512 if you're using one of our Bibles, if you want to open it on, you know, in your phone or tablet or whatever. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And I think that this passage is going to be helpful because um, it's just, it's helpful in navigating difficult moments like this. Um, and, and there's something you should know about Proverbs as we get started. A couple of things. Um, first of all, it's basically just a, a collection of wise sayings from an ancient Israelite king. His name was Solomon, and he was given by God a divine level of wisdom. He had, he had passed on to him this level of insight that no one else before or after him had had. And so he would say and write really wise things, and they were collected into this book called Proverbs. There's a number of other authors as well, but it's mostly Solomon. And so he's just talking about how to live wisely, like wisdom is basically just how to live well in real time in the world. Like how to make good calls, how to respond well to bad calls, that kind of a thing. And Solomon was great at this because God had given him insight. And so, um, you know, he, he writes all these, these sayings which were collected, which we get to live our lives by now, which is great because we get divine insight into everyday life. But there's also something you should know that um, sometimes this book gets a little bit abused because people misunderstand its nature. But Proverbs is really more principles than promises. It's more principles than promises. And what I mean by that is it's just kind of observations about how life normally works on average in real time. Like it's not designed to be just like a formulaic book where you put in this and you get out this. It's not, that's not how it's designed. It's really just observations. And um, you know, it's a lot like Proverbs today. It, there are wise sayings that we have in our culture like, um, like, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right, you've heard that before? Well, when people say that, they don't literally mean, hey, if you go to bed at a very particular time, and you wake up at a very particular time, it will guarantee that in every case, you will never go to the doctor, you will always be wealthy, and you'll be the smartest person you know. Right? That's not how it works. Um, you know, and in fact, we can think of counterexamples right away. Like, snarky people like me kind of are like, okay, well, I'm going to get on the Googles and we're going to figure this out. And so I'm like, uh, did you know that Winston Churchill actually worked through the night most of the time and JFK took three to four hour naps every afternoon? So, successful people don't have to go to bed early and get up early. Duh. <laughs> Which is like, okay, great. Like, so you can think of a counterexample. But the point still remains. If someone says to you, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, what they're trying to say is, you could probably use some more discipline, and they're probably right. You know what I mean? So it's just an observation about how life works in general. It's an observation, but something that we have to keep in mind is while it is just an observation about how life normally works, it's coming from the person who created the universe and wrote the rules. Like, this is coming from God. So when God says, this is how things work on average, he's probably right. And so... Yeah, we should follow that. Like, we should base our lives on these principles and not stress the exceptions. Like, what he has to say is from him. Like, he's, he's God, so we should follow what he has to say. We should follow these principles. So, um, I want to jump in here and walk through what he has to say about moments when we come up against an obstacle. What, what are we supposed to do? How do we understand that? And, and I think, uh, yeah, let me just go ahead and read it, and then we'll jump into it a little further. So, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, says this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Now, that might be a familiar verse, especially if you grew up in church, but even if you didn't grow up in church, you might have heard that before, or like seen it on some wall art, or like cross-stitched into some pillows. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty common verse, um, but what I think we miss in, in its familiarity is the fact that the, he's kind of buried the lead. Like, like the coolest part about this verse is way at the end. At the very end, he says, he will make your paths straight. And I'm like, straight paths? Like, I can get some straight, why isn't that up front? Like, why isn't it, why don't you just lead with that? Like, hey, you can get straight paths. I'm like, then I'm listening, but let's like buried way at the end here. You can have straight paths, he's saying. Straight paths, well, what are straight paths? Straight paths have, they have no surprises. They've got no curveballs. There's no like robbers waiting around the corner to like jump you. You know, like straight paths are awesome. It's smooth sailing. I want me some straight paths. Like, I'm all about straight paths. 
So what do I have to do to get them? I want to be able to see what's coming for miles. I mean, because we've all had times in our life where our life took a big turn and we weren't expecting it. And it can be really off-putting. But, you know, it wouldn't be that bad. Like, things might get rocky down the road, but it wouldn't be as bad if we just had a little bit of warning. Right? If I just had, like, some foresight into the future about what was going on, it wouldn't be that bad. I'm not asking for a perfect life. I'm just asking for a little bit of warning. Right? And so that's what a straight path is. And so I'm saying, what do I have to do to get that? I'm in. So let's look at what he says. He gives some, some statements about what we need to do in order to get those straight paths. He says three things in particular, and they're kind of in a poetic format. So what I want to do is I want to take those three statements and sort of boil them down into one sentence, okay? So in, on your program, you've got a, uh, a box with a line, okay? That line is going to be the sentence once it's finally constructed. But it's going to come to you in pieces. So I already know that some of you are a little stressed about whether or not it's going to fit in the box, and I get that. Like, I really do. I'm OCD too. So if you want to wait until I've given you the whole sentence to write the whole thing, that's totally fine, okay? You can just, like, take a deep breath. You could write it in all caps or, like, whatever, you know, like, whatever is your normal format, you can just wait to the end and I'll give it to you. I'm saying too much. Okay. So let's, let's d dive into it. What do we need to do to get straight paths? Well, the verse starts off and it says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. So that's the first thing we need to do if we're going to get straight paths. I would summarize it this way. This is the first part of the sentence. Trust God. Very simply, trust God. And, and he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And in the ancient Jewish way of thinking, when, when we think of heart, we tend to think of emotions. Like, I love you with all my heart. So that's kind of like a lovey-dovey emotional thing. But in the ancient Jewish way of thinking, they thought about the heart a little bit differently. It was more, it was a closer equivalent to what we might say, like, the brain or the reality of the inner man. Because... It really wasn't until the influence of Greek philosophy later that we started like kind of chopping up humanity into little pieces like your volition and your will and your rational thought and your intellect and personality and all those kinds of things. They were a little bit more holistic in how they viewed the human. And so the heart captures most of the things that we would reference when we would say something like the mind. So in other words, the heart was the center of your consciousness, of your thoughts, of your will and volition. For them, the stomach was more like the place where you felt emotions, which actually kind of makes sense because when you, when you love someone and you get the butterflies when you're around them, where do you feel those? You feel them in your stomach, right? So it, it kind of makes sense. They thought about the stomach as emotions and the heart more as we might think about the mind. And so he's saying, trust in God with all of your decision-making faculties, all of your conscious mind. When you trust something, you transfer all of your hope all of your expectations, all the weight of that moment onto something else. That's what you do when you trust it. So it's kind of like sitting on a chair or, or like a stool here. This is a reasonably trustworthy stool. So I, if I were to sit on it, I would trust it with all of my weight. I'm going to like put all of my girth right on top of this stool right here, okay? Just sitting right down on there. I've got no backup plan. I got no plan B, I got no escape hatch. All of my weight is right on this stool right now, okay? This is trusting in this stool with all of my heart. However, if there were a stool that were less trustworthy, for instance, this stool that I helped put together, um, it would be harder to trust it. Um, if you remember the Hawaii chair from a few weeks ago, this is, this is like a prototype of the Hawaii chair, all right? It's, it's, a little, it's a little rough. And I'm not trusting nothing on this stool, okay? I'm not trusting any of my girth units on its own on top of this thing. So I'm just going to kind of lean on it, but I'm going to have a solid backup plan. Like, I am totally going to have a plan B. I am going to, like, maintain some measure of control by keeping my feet on the ground because there's no way I'm trusting this stool with all of my weight. It's just not going to happen. All right? So this is an illustration of what we sometimes do in our lives with God. We trust him, but not, like, not like all the way, right? I mean, like, I'm going to think this. I'm going to run the numbers. I'm going to make sure that I have, in case what he asks of me is a little too much, I'm going to maintain a measure of control because otherwise it's just going to get a little crazy. I don't trust him with everything. And this is an illustration of how not to trust God. What we need to do is trust God with all of our heart. Transfer all of our hope, all of our weight onto him, knowing that he is worthy of our trust. No partial trust, no escape hatch, no plan B. All of our weight, all of our trust, all of our hope, all of our heart. He says, trust in the Lord. He's tried the whole partial trust thing, and he's saying, it's no good. You don't want that. Trust in God. And then he continues on. He says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. So, so far, you're supposed to trust God. And I would continue that sentence by saying you should trust God, not yourself. That's my summary of the next section. Trust God, not yourself. 
Because in essence, it's a restatement of what he's already said. He's just saying it negatively. We've already transferred our trust to God already, right? We've already given over all of our trust to him, not to ourselves, right? Once you've done that, you can't have any trust in anything else. You can't have all of your trust in one place and then have it divided. For instance, if I'm going to sit on these stools, I can't sit on both of them and have my weight on all of either one of these, right? My trust is divided between these two stools. And I don't think you understand how, how risky this is, what I'm doing right now. Like, there's no applause. None of you seem excited or nervous or applauding or anything. This is like a stunt, okay? Like this. So anyway, I'm going to move that. I just, no. <laughs> um, but so when, when you trust, you've got to, if you're going to transfer all of your weight, you can't have it divided. Trust in God, not in yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't use our brains, that we can't use common sense, that we can't put together a plan, that we aren't allowed to think something through. It just means, you know, God created us with a rational mind for that purpose. It just means that all of those processes need to be resting on the foundation of ultimately full trust with all of our heart in God. So we need to trust God, not yourself. And then it continues on. He says, trust in God, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And then here's our our final piece. In all your ways, submit to him. In all your ways, submit to him. So I would finalize that last statement if, if we're saying trust God, not yourself, no matter what. No matter what, in all your ways, not some of your ways, not just the hard stuff, not just the easy stuff, all of the stuff, all of the things need to be submitted to God. That means your job and your lack of job, your kids, your lack of kids, your spouse, your lack of spouse, your future, your lack of a future, your retirement or your (laughs) not going to retire. All of that needs to be submitted to God. And I love that it says submit because submission is a voluntary act. You can't be, no, someone can't submit you. That, that when, they're, when someone were to do something like that, that's suppression. Someone can suppress you, but you have to choose submission. Submission is when you willingly place yourself under the control, under the authority of someone else. And that needs to be our posture toward God. Trust in God, not yourself, no matter what. We have to be willing to defer to God in every aspect of our lives, whether it's comfortable or not. And Solomon says, if we do this, if we trust in God, not ourselves, no matter what, then we get straight paths. Those paths that we talked about earlier that are devoid of surprises or random twists and turns. They're free from danger or concern. This is the kind of trust that produces straight paths. But the funny thing about that statement, trust in God, not yourself, no matter what, is that it's the exact opposite of what I do when I come up against an obstacle, right? I mean, if you're like me, when I come up against an obstacle, I make my own luck. I bulldoze my own straight path. I'm not trying to trust anybody else with this process, but God says the only way to a straight path is through trust in him alone all the time. But you can't get this wrong because it's an active decision to place your trust in God and walk forward. Trusting God is an active process, It's active. This is not like some fatalistic moment where it's just like, Jesus, take the wheel, right? This is not like some simple platitude about how we need to let go and let God. Though I understand the sentiment of those statements, this is an active choice of our volition. We have to choose trust over control. This is an active decision that every day we make the decision, I trust God, not myself. And and here's the deal. This is important. When we, when we get to this place, when we trust God, not ourselves, no matter what, we get to a place where for a heart that trusts, every path is straight. For a heart that trusts, every path is straight. And that's amazing. That means it's straight fear that's, that's free from paralyzing fear or from stress or from concern that prevents progress or from surprises. If you trust God, he will make your paths straight. For a heart that trusts, every path is straight. But to be honest, that should make you a little skeptical, right? Because we've all known people who seem to trust God with everything, but yet they had terrible circumstances that came out of the blue, that were a total surprise, that made no sense, right? So how could this possibly be true? Is this just another principle, not a promise? We're kind of wasting our time here? I don't think it is. I think this is something that you can bank on, and here's why. Because if you are trusting God, not yourself, no matter what, nothing can catch you off guard. Nothing will seem out of the blue. And why is that? 
Well, it's because you've transferred the oversight of your life to someone who can't be surprised. Because you've given over your future to someone who is orchestrating all of the events of your life for your good. And so that doesn't mean that nothing that ever happens is hard. Of course not. It just means that no matter what, God can be trusted. And in that sense, straight paths not become not an external reality, but an internal condition where a path that once looked dark and dangerous and curvy and, and uncontrollable now looks straight and looks bright and looks clear, not because anything changed in the future, but because our internal condition about the future has changed. We've entrusted that future to someone who's worthy of that trust, and God can be trusted. And when you get to that place, for a heart that trusts like that, every path is straight. It's navigable. It's bearable because God can be trusted. And here's the thing. I think something amazing happens when we get to that place. When we get that kind of confidence in our lives, something incredible happens. When your path is straight, your heart is courageous. When you feel that kind of confidence about the nature of the future, suddenly your courage soars. Your willingness to take risks soars because you've got the emotional and spiritual bandwidth to say, look, I don't care what's coming, bring it on. Because I have a God that I trust with my future, so it doesn't matter what's coming, bring it. I, my heart is courageous because my path is straight. So we can say bring it on because our path is straight. Our path is straight because we trust and that produces a courageous heart. So I guess the question is, what does this have to do with the future of our church? What does this have to do with the obstacle that's presently in our way? And that's a valid question. But before we get there, I want to just tell you how this has intersected with um, my family story, with me and, me and Lauren. Um, last year, the leadership of our church came to us and asked if we would consider uh, leading the Henrietta campus. And when they first asked, I frankly was uh, terrified because... Man, it was scary. We were loving what we were doing with students. So we had felt like we were sort of just getting the rhythm. You know, we had talked about the reality that someday we would transition maybe to be a campus pastor because it seemed like the natural next step in kind of our church's leadership structure. But at the same time, we didn't expect it to be now. And so there we were, Lauren and I, we were realizing that now all of a sudden our path has a huge obstacle in it. It's got a mountain in our pathway. And it was a big obstacle. And that might, <laughs> that might sound a little bit lame. You're like, okay, bro, seriously. Like a promotion in your organization is an obstacle, really. <laughs> like your life must be pretty good. But, and, and I get that, but at the same time, we love the people that we serve with. We love the students that we get to be a part of. Like, I mean, we've got memories and experiences that we can't trade that we've loved over the last four years. So it became a difficult thing. It wasn't a bad obstacle. It was a good obstacle. It just was going to produce a lot of work. It's kind of like uh, us launching a campus. It's not a bad obstacle, it's a good obstacle. It just is going to mean sweat and hard work and hard conversations and things that we don't necessarily always want to do. And so we are in a difficult place making this call. And um, this might, this, this won't surprise you. Um, I'm a verbal processor. Um, <laughs> So I have to talk things through. Um, and, and another way that I do that is I write, I, I journal a lot because it just helps me kind of keep my brain straight. And don't judge me. You're ju right now, I feel your judgment. Don't, okay? I need the journal. Fine. So, anyway, I was working this through on paper, just trying to think through, trying to get my thoughts straight. And, you know, Lauren and I, I think this reflects her heart as well. We, we knew two things for sure. One, we trusted God. We knew that this was not a surprise to him, even though it was a surprise to us. So we trusted him. But then second of all, we already knew this was kind of a no-brainer, right? This was sort of an obvious decision. Like, we, we've just had a kid. It's a natural life stage transition. Um, you know, the college-oriented campus. It just seems like it fits. It's like all of it, all the pieces pointed toward this being an obvious decision. It shouldn't be that hard, but we still weren't sure. So here's what I wrote in my journal. I just want to share it with you because I think it's relevant for our church. So I wrote this. Um, Dear diary. <laughs> that's a joke, but you thought that's what it was going to be because you were judging me. Unbelievable. I'm trying to share my heart with these people. Okay, so here, here are some of the things I was, the questions we were asking. Um, am I the right guy for the job? Can I let go of the enjoyment and the passion we have for student ministry? I mean, this seems like such an obvious decision. Why is it so hard to decide? I think this is where courage trumps wisdom. Or maybe where courage is more necessary than wisdom. Because this is not a hard call. The right choice is seemingly obvious. 
This is instead a hard path to walk. And the decision is not what's the way forward. Instead, the question is, do I have the courage to keep walking? This is a straight path, but one with a mountain obstacle that it won't be easy to, to, to traverse. But the question is, will you walk on in confidence that God is not surprised by the presence of a mountain in your path? In fact, he built it for your path. He has carefully and lovingly constructed this mountain with your growth in mind. Your comfort? No. Your growth. Because this is a mountain that can only be overcome at personal cost. And so that pain I'm feeling is not the pain of discerning where to go, but rather am I willing to pay the price to ascend to the place that God is calling me to go? To leave behind something that we love for something that God is calling us to. And frankly, I have no idea if I have that courage. At this moment, I feel it's equally likely that I will bravely climb or sit and cry or move backwards. And then I wrote this, and I, I think it's really relevant for our church, is a prayer. I said, God, please stop providing me with such blinding clarity about the future. Please instead start drowning me in white-hot, stalwart courage. Because our trust in God had already provided us with a straight path. But now we needed phase two. We needed the reality that because our path was straight, our heart could be courageous. And here's the thing. I think that prayer, stop with the clarity, turn up the courage, is actually a prayer that many of us in our church should be praying right now. Because as a church, to be honest, we probably don't need more clarity. We don't need a lot more clarity in our life. We, when we think about launching a campus and the sacrifice that it's going to require, we already know the need. We know that our neighbors need Jesus no matter what town they live in. We know that our city, that our county is in de desperate need of the gospel. We know what's next for our church, that Henrietta is where God is leading us to go. You might even know specifically what God is calling you to do. Whether that means that you, know, you need to go help launch this campus or you need to change campuses to backfill or you need to give extravagantly or begin serving at the campus that you attend or leave the comfort of the campus where your family attends to go to the place that's more strategic for your neighbors. The question is not, is this good? We don't need any more clarity about the future. Church, we need more courage. Because sacrificing financially, man, it sounded good last week. But it's hard this week, and it's going to be hard every week for the next six months, okay? Because leaving the campus where your family and friends are to go to the one that's more strategic for your neighbors isn't going to be comfortable because the locks on the trailer are going to be freezing cold at 5 a.m. in January <laughs> and in July, okay? We live in Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> because serving one and attending one, it's not going to be easy when the game's on or when you didn't sleep great last night. And how could you invest in someone else's future when you don't know what's coming in your own future? But for a heart that trusts, every path is straight. And when your path is straight, your heart is courageous. And this principle doesn't just apply in hashtag four rock. It applies in our life as well. You know, husband, you probably don't need more clarity about what it would mean to love your wife well in your marriage. You just need the courage to do it. And you probably don't need more clarity about what it would mean to be ethical in your workplace. But you just need the courage to do it no matter what it costs. You might not need a lot more clarity about what it looks like to be sexually pure in your school, but you need the courage to do it. And in your relationships, we don't need a lot more clarity about whether or not these people need Jesus. We need the courage to tell them about Jesus. So will you join me in praying, not for clarity, but for courage to do what we already know that God is calling us to do? And when it comes to hashtag four rock, will you pray and give and go or all of those things so that we can reach this city for Jesus? Man, our mandate is clear. There are next steps for our church that we cannot deny they're obvious. And we're on the verge of a step as a church that once we start, we can't come back. A step that's going to propel us toward the mess in our city, in our region, the mess that God has called us to for thousands of years that as a church we get to step into. The call is clear. Man, it couldn't be any more clear. We are trusting God for a straight path and he gave it to us. He made it clear so we have the courage to follow through with what he's asked us to do. Will you join me as I step forward into a future that I'm not sure about, but I'm confident that I have a God whose plan is a lot better than mine, and he's already provided us the direction of where we need to go. We've just got to do it. And I mean, the question, should we go? <laughs> it's obviously yes. And the question, is it going to be easy? Is obviously no. But the question that we have to answer is, will I, will we as a family, will we as a church have the courage to do what God has clearly asked us to do? 
Maybe it is that you do need to leave the campus that you attend and help us launch in Henrietta. We're going to talk more about that next week. Or maybe you do need to, you know, attend a campus that's closest to your home, most strategic for your neighbors, or you need to continue with that commitment from last week, or like we said, serve generously, or just love your family well, or be ethical in your workplace, or say no to that pop-up ad for the first time in your life, or whatever it is that you need to do. We don't likely need more clarity. We do need more courage. So the only question that remains for us as a church together is this, simply, do I have the courage? Do we have the courage to pray, to give, and to go? Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, your word, which does provide us with sometimes blinding and embarrassing and scary clarity about who we are and where we fall short and about what you expect from us. But we also thank you that the clarity that it provides enables us to step confidently in the future, into the future knowing that you will provide for us, that you won't ask us to do something that you won't provide the power for us to do. So pr we pray this morning for courage, for hearts that would be brave because of what you've done for us. And may we obey you as your children today because of your gospel, because of your cross and your empty tomb, and see that our city come to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so if you would here in Aranaquit, if you would stand, we're going to sing, and we're going to sing as a response to the truth that we've heard, that our future is secure, that we can be courageous in our straight path because our future is founded on a rock, the rock of our salvation that cannot and will not be moved.